Hello, all you freedom-loving people. Welcome to another episode of Front Page. I'm your host, Scott Cameron Goulet. After more than a week of forensics, the Secret Service finally announced that they were unable to find out who the person was who brought the cocaine into the White House. This conclusion is not all that surprising. Did you really expect them to turn over the perpetrator? And the Secret Service says that this wasn't the first time that drugs have been found in the White House in the past two years. So why hasn't the public heard about this? Blaine Lukemeyer, at a hearing in Congress, asked the CEOs of the five largest banks, your websites say you support all social justice, but you went to China and ignored the genocide. Their answer was silence. But we are glad to see some non-politicians and business giants doing what they should in the face of the evil of the CCP. Although they have sacrificed their interest to do so, they are the true heroes of our time. Hollywood is now in a complete shutdown. More than two months after the writers went on strike, the actors now announced a strike. Perhaps this is the crisis that will lead to the elimination of a number of far-left acting companies. Elon Musk has once again declared that he's an alien. He may be joking, but the netizens seriously believe it. Okay, let's get into it. The Secret Service announced on Thursday that it could not determine who smuggled cocaine into the White House on July 2nd. This prompted a series of objections from lawmakers and pundits. The Secret Service was unable to identify the smuggler despite using two techniques from the FBI's crime lab to try and lift fingerprints. Kelly O'Donnell from NBC News tweeted, Sources tell me no information resulting from forensic testing or video review has been able to identify a suspect. A list of several hundred individuals was compiled who may have had access to the area. And CNN reported that Secret Service officials reviewed visitor logs and surveillance footage of hundreds of visitors who were granted access to the West Wing, but they found no suspects. And Joe Concha, a columnist for The Messenger, tweeted, the most surveilled property in the world somehow can't produce video evidence of who left a bag of cocaine near the situation room at the White House and apparently the suspect was wearing gloves in the middle of summer. Incredible. The Secret Service has been targeting their search on visitors. However, they have seemingly ruled out Hunter Biden as the most likely suspect. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene believes that the substance was brought into the White House by a pass holder. In addition, Representative Lauren Boebert said that the White House controls who has access to White House lockers for individual use. The substance was found in Locker 50. Boebert stated that the key to Locker 50 is currently missing. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy criticized it as yet another example of Biden family privilege. McCarthy said, this is the most secure building probably in America. Just to get into the door before you get through the gate, you go through security as a member of Congress. When I come with my own security, I still go through security. They have cameras 24 seven. It just seems to me when it comes to the Biden Inc. family, they get treated differently than anybody else. But there is more surprising news. A Secret Service spokesperson told the Washington Post on July 13th that this is not the first time that drugs were found in the White House. As early as last year, there have been two times in the executive residence that they found a small amount of marijuana. The Secret Service spokesperson noted that according to the Secret Service, Uniform Division small amounts of marijuana were found at security checkpoints on two separate occasions in June and September of 2022, but no arrests were made in those incidents. However, because the weight of the confiscated marijuana did not meet the legal threshold for federal charges or for District of Columbia misdemeanor criminal charges, Representative Bobart claimed that the two other instances from the past year in which marijuana was found was not adequately reported or addressed. Bobert said, this is the third time that drugs have been found on the White House property since 2022, and we did not even hear about the marijuana. Former NBA player Enos Kanter Freedom attended a Congressional Executive Commission on China hearing on Tuesday that was chaired by Representative Chris Smith and Senator Jeff Merkley. The hearing was titled, Corporate Complicity Subsidizing the PRC's Human Rights Violations. The hearing focused on human rights violations in China. 
It included genocide, live organ harvesting, forced labor, internet censorship, and mass surveillance. The hearing also focused on the fact that international businesses and corporations are seeking to do business in China or to maintain access to the Chinese market, and they face a very high risk of becoming inadvertently complicit in human rights abuses. Cantor said at the hearing that his career came to a screeching halt when he publicly opposed the Chinese Communist Party. It cost him about $50 million in salary and possible endorsements. But he has no regrets about his actions. He said, I sleep in peace at night knowing that I did the right thing. My only question is, how can the biggest dictatorship in the world, China, control 100% American-made companies and fire an American citizen. Cantor has been a voice for human rights since 11 years ago. At the time, he often spoke out about human rights violations in his home country of Turkey. Once, he was in New York attending a simple basketball camp. While there, he was asked by a parent why he did not speak out against the Chinese Communist Party's abusive behavior toward members of the Uyghur and other Muslim minorities. From there, he began to research allegations of human rights violations against Uyghurs and others. On one occasion, he spoke to a concentration camp survivor who told him in detail about her experiences of torture, gang rape, forced sterilization, and abortion in the camps. He said, at that moment, I said to myself, I don't care what it takes, I'm going to help these people. The former Boston Celtic center, Cantor, has made headlines for speaking out against human rights abuses by the Chinese Communist Party. His comments also led to the Celtics games being pulled by Chinese media. China and several Chinese brands are major sponsors of the NBA. As a result, Cantor was later marginalized by the league and it ended his career prematurely. Cantor said, my entire life, I worked so hard to achieve my NBA dream and I made it. However, because I wanted to stand up for what is right, my career ended in a very brutal way. Nevertheless, Cantor has vowed to continue to speak out against the human rights abuses that are committed by the Chinese Communist Party and other authoritarian powers. Cantor told the lawmakers, freedom is not free and it's going to come with some consequences. But someone had to stand up for the innocent around the world no matter how much money or business I have lost because of it. And Cantor is not alone in his call for human rights and resistance to totalitarian regimes. U.S. Representative Ralph Norman spoke at the Capitol on July 13th. He described the history of the Epoch Times. He praised the Epoch Times for its ongoing mission to provide uncensored information to readers around the world despite facing oppression by the Chinese Communist regime. When he first started reading the Epoch Times, Representative Norman told reporters that he didn't know anything about the paper's founders or the history of the Epoch Times. He just found the paper fascinating. The Epoch Times reports the news unfiltered and it focuses on communism and its impact on the country. He said, this is all about one word, freedom. Knowing the journey that the Epoch Times has taken, he decided to put the history of the Epoch Times into the U.S. congressional record. When John Tang was earning his doctoral degree in physics at Georgia Tech in 1999, he never imagined that some 20 years later, <clears throat> he would be heading the fourth largest American newspaper by subscription count. At the time, the Chinese Communist Party, the CCP, had just started persecuting the spiritual discipline Falun Gong practiced at the time by roughly one in every 12 Chinese. Like other persecution campaigns by the CCP, the CCP authorities relied on the media that is under their control to discredit and to isolate Falun Gong. In order to demonize Falun Gong and to justify its persecution, the media constantly carried out hate propaganda and it attacked this peaceful meditation group. After watching in horror from the United States as his friends in China were persecuted for their beliefs, while Western media amplified the CCP's propaganda, John Tang and his friends decided to take action. They started the Chinese edition of the Epoch Times in the basement of John's home in suburban Atlanta. As soon as the paper was launched, 
its staff was subjected to endless harassment and persecution by the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP police have arrested Epoch Times reporters and editors in China, some of whom have been sentenced to 10 years in prison and tortured. The CCP has threatened the Epoch Times advertisers, they have attacked the Epoch Times website and IT systems, and they have threatened relatives of the Epoch Times employees in China. In 2006, assailants broke into the home of Chief Engineer Peter Lee in Atlanta. They tied him to a chair and they beat him before stealing his computers. In Hong Kong in 2019, assailants set fire to the newspaper's printing press and in 2021, armed men stormed the premises and smashed printing equipment with sledgehammers. In a difficult environment, the Epoch Times has achieved admirable results. The Epoch Times China operation went underground, yet the Chinese edition quickly became a leading website on Chinese current events with millions of readers. Its print, its, its print newspaper is now distributed nationwide to as, to as well as in, in, in 30 other countries around the world. Every day, many Chinese break through the CCP's internet firewall to read the Epoch Times website. The Epoch Times not only provides unfiltered information to the Chinese people, but it also helps the world understand the evil nature of the CCP. As a result of the Epoch Times publications of these special series, nine commentaries on the, Chi on the Communist Party, which provides the most thorough interview to date of the true nature of the CCP, more than 410 million Chinese people and counting have sought to sever their membership in this party and the, and the affiliated organizations. Realizing that the CCP had invested enormous effort in infiltrating the U.S., especially media organizations, resulting in many U.S. media outlets spreading propaganda for the CCP regime, the Epoch Times then launched an English version in 2003 and they began publishing an English version of the Epoch Times in New York in 2004. Just like its Chinese companion, the Epoch Times prides itself in being independent and serving the interest of the readers. Under the, its slogan, Truth and Tradition, the Epoch Times adheres to the best practices and highest principles of journalism and seeks to highlight the best of humanity to inspire people. The independent reporting of the Epoch Times has attracted a large number of readers in the United States and it is now the fourth largest newspaper in the United States by subscribers. Hollywood actors stopped working en masse on Thursday night after the Hollywood Actors Union failed to reach a new contract with the studios. Union leaders said in a statement on Thursday that the studios remain unwilling to offer a fair deal on the key issues that are essential to our union members. The Writers Union has now been on strike for 70 days. So this is the first time that there has been an industry-wide shutdown in Hollywood in 63 years. During the strike, unionized actors are not allowed to make any film or television productions, they are not allowed to attend any press conferences or film premieres, and they are not allowed to promote any work at Comic-Con. Oppenheimer, the film about the father of the atomic bomb, premiered in London. The red carpet started an hour early in order to avoid violating union rules. This was because the filmmakers feared that the American Screen Actors Guild would announce the start of a strike before the main actors' photo shoots and interviews were over. This would have resulted in the actors of the film having to leave the stage in the middle of their film premiere. The filming of Gladiator 2 and Mortal Kombat 2 has been halted, while the filming series of Emily in Paris has also been delayed. Currently, the Screen Actors Guild and the Amalgamated Radio and Television Arts Guild has a total of 160,000 members. This includes male and female film artists, stuntmen, voiceover artists, singers, and others. For Hollywood, and especially the traditional television industry, two simultaneous prolonged strikes will almost certainly hasten the slow but certain demise of the medium as a lack of new content will cause more people to cut the cord. These Hollywood companies are laying off thousands of workers in the weak economy and the strikes have made the situation even worse. The writer's strike has also led to layoffs at Hollywood talent agencies, which often rely on commissions and fees from production deals. But 
with many studios refusing to greenlight projects amid labor uncertainty, talent agencies are finding themselves with little to do. And streaming services could also be hit hard. Elon Musk has always been a topic of conversation. A few days ago, he tweeted that he keeps telling people that he's an alien, but no one believes him. This shocking statement has sparked another outpouring of comments from netizens. This time, the discussion starts with, what are the most fundamental unanswered questions? This is the first tweet from the official Twitter account of the new artificial intelligence company XAI. Lex Friedman, a scientist at MIT, was the first to ask, can AI become conscious? Musk replied, I often wonder where consciousness starts as we progress from one cell to 35 trillion cells. If the standard model is correct, then quarks and leptons become conscious no later than 13.8 billion years from start, assuming there are no sentient aliens. At the end, he added one more sentence, by the way, where are the aliens? Friedman wrote, aliens might already be here. Musk then went on to say, I keep telling people I'm an alien, but no one believes me. He also added the winking emoji. This is not the first time that Elon Musk has claimed to be an alien. He also tweeted last November that I'm an alien, trying to get back to my home planet. It's no wonder that some people think that he builds spacecrafts in order to return to his home planet Mars. And that's a wrap for this episode. Thank you all for your support of Front Page. Please remember that every like, comment, and share helps more people to see the truth. If you haven't already, please subscribe. And if you have already subscribed, we thank you, but please double check to make sure that you are still subscribed because some of our audience have reported that they're somehow unsubscribed without their knowledge. Okay, this is our show for today. Thank you for tuning in. If you like what you heard today, please don't forget to like this video and share it with your friends and family because everybody deserves to know the truth. Again, thank you for watching Front Page and we will see you next time.